What is the truth about the Battle of Culloden and how Scottish were the Jacobite army that fought at Culloden? Lying around five miles east of Inverness, this is Culloden Muir, the site of the last pitched battle on British soil. The Jacobite Rising of 1745 led to this battlefield the following year, with the Jacobites unified under the banner of restoring the House of Stuart to the British throne. The Jacobites were led by Charles Edward Stuart, also known as the Young Pretender or Bonnie Prince Charlie, whereas the British forces were led by William Augustus, known as the Duke of Cumberland, who ate all the pies, eh? The son of King George II of Britain and Ireland. So just for context as we move through this video, at the battlefield today, the red flags represent where the British forces under Cumberland lined up, and the blue flags represent the Jacobite position. But how did we get here? What events led to this battlefield, and why was so much blood shed? Well, the story starts with King Billy, and Game of Thrones style family connections. The Glorious Revolution of 1688-89 set off a political earthquake in these isles that reverberated for over half a century. It started when Charles's grandfather, James II, also known as James VII, a Catholic king from the House of Stuart who had ruled as the King of Scotland, England and Ireland since 1685, was overthrown in the Glorious Revolution of 1688-89 by his daughter Mary II of England and her husband William of Orange, who was actually Mary's first cousin, which was quite common amongst royalty at different times through history a Protestant prince from the Netherlands. The revolution took place shortly after the birth of James Francis Edward Stuart in 1688, the son, and therefore male heir, from King James's second marriage with Mary of Medina. Thus, Mary II of England's path to the throne was threatened by the birth of James Francis Edward Stuart, who would later go on to have a son of his own, Charles or Bonnie Prince Charlie. Various factors, including other internal pressures against James II, led to him being overthrown and fleeing to France. Mary and William of Orange took the British throne in 1689 and co-reigned until Mary's death five years later, with William of Orange going on to solely reign until his death in 1702. After William's death, Mary's sister Anne reigned as Queen until 1714, when the throne was passed to King George I of the House of Hanover. Now I know that's a lot of family politics, but it's crucial to understanding the Jacobite Revolution. There were numerous factors that led to the rise of the Jacobites, but they unified under the banner of restoring the exiled House of Stuart to the British throne. The Fortified Rising was not the first one either, as there had been previous Jacobite Risings, including the failed 1715 Rising. Also importantly to note is that there were numerous undercurrents around this time, including that Scotland and England had only merged into a political union in 1707, forming the United Kingdom of Great Britain. Against this backdrop, Bonnie Prince Charlie, believing there was support for a Stuart restoration in both Scotland and England, landed in Scotland in July 1745, quickly raising an army of Jacobite supporters. He had taken Edinburgh by September and defeated a British government force at Preston Pans. Emboldened, the Jacobites then invaded England, reaching as far as Derby. The British government had to recall 12,000 troops from the continent to deal with the Rising, many who had been fighting in the War of Austrian Succession. The Jacobites soon turned back to Scotland, however, having attracted relatively few English recruits and without a French landing as they had hoped for. The Jacobites, with limited French military support, attempted to consolidate their control of Scotland, where by early 1746 they were opposed by a substantial government army. After a somewhat hollow Jacobite victory at Falkirk, the Jacobite leadership were left with few other options than to stand and fight. The two armies eventually met at Culloden, on terrain that gave Cumberland's larger, well-rested force the advantage. These references to France, however, speaks to an important point. How Scottish were the Jacobites who fought at Culloden? Very quickly, if you value these videos and you want me to continue to make them, please consider supporting me on Patreon. 
Thanks to everyone who does support me, and thanks to everyone who voted in the recent poll of what videos you wanted to see. The Battle of Culloden was on that list, and I'm also going to make videos um, on the truth about Hadrian's Wall Part 2, and also on the Pictish Standing Stones. But for, yeah, for exclusive benefits, and to support this work in general, as after all, I'm not taxpayer funded like the BBC. Please check out the link, top link in the video description below and sign up to become a member um, of my Patreon page for as little as a pound or two per month. Thank you and now on with the video. Well, there was of course a significant Scottish presence amongst the Jacobite ranks, but there were also different nationalities involved. The Battle of Culloden speaks to the geopolitics of the time. If you were looking for an ally against the English and the British, who would you turn to? The French, of course. The Stuarts had lived in exile in France amongst other places, and the French provided military equipment, supplies and some troops to the Jacobites, although at times French support wasn't as strong as the Jacobites hoped for. As well as of course large numbers of Scots, the Jacobite army at the Battle of Culloden included some English, French and Irish troops. In fact, two units attached to the French Royal Army itself fought at Culloden the Irish Brigades and the Royal Scots, or Royal Ecosse, who were largely made up of Irish and Scottish exiles. I am going to do a follow-up video on which clans fought at Culloden also. The opposing side as well wasn't simply made up of English troops either. The reality was that Scots fought on both sides at the Battle of Culloden. One unit that fought on Cumberland's side was the Campbell Argyll Militia, formed in 1745 to resist the Jacobite Rising by the Chief of Clan Campbell, John Campbell, 4th Duke of Argyll. It was made up of Highlanders, and it speaks to the history of the independent Highland companies in general, which were irregular militias that were formed by the order of the British government and were made up of Highlanders with this practice dating back to as far back as the early 17th century. In the lead up to the Battle of Culloden, the British Army practiced a new bayonet drill to combat the Highland Charge. So unfortunately I forgot my, my bayonet in the car, so I have to improvise. I, instead of simply stabbing straight in front, the British Army were trained to stab to the right hand side, basically to get around the shield of the Jacobites. To, to stabbing to the right. How effective this actually was in battle is unknown, um, but it is an interesting detail to note. Around 1pm on the 16th of April 1746, the two sides met. The Jacobites had attempted to launch a surprise night attack before, but this failed as they never reached Cumberland's camp before daybreak and had to retreat back to Culloden Moor. The Highland army mustered up only around five to 6,000 men at Culloden. Its mounted arm was very weak, and the motley collection of 12 cannon available was of different calibres and poorly served. They stood against Cumberland's well-trained army of around 9,000 men, made up of a well-balanced force of horse and foot, supported by 10 three-pound cannon and six mortars. The battlefield as well was ill-chosen, as it afforded a clear field of fire to Cumberland's artillery. Even today visiting the battlefield, although it might be slightly different and vegetation may have grown more, it immediately strikes you how open the battlefield is and also how uneven the ground is of the battlefield. One of the Jacobites' main weapons would have been the Highland Charge, but to run at any speed over this terrain must have proved extremely difficult. The Highlanders were cannonaded for nearly half an hour without effective reply. Orders to attack passed slowly down the Highland Army's chaotic chain of command, but eventually the Highlanders were unleashed. They charged across the 350 yards of ground separating them from the enemy. On the left, the Macdonalds never reached the British line, but the large Highland regiment on the right, Clan Chatton, smashed into Barrow's 4th and Munro's 37th foot with great force. They were repulsed after fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat, only a few Highlanders fighting their way through to make an unavailing attack on Cumberland's second line. At this point, the British cavalry began to work their way around the Highlanders' flanks, converting defeat into a rout. The pursuit itself extended all the way to Inverness. The actual fighting had lasted less than an hour. 
Between 1000 and 1500, Jacobites were killed. Few were wounded. The casualties in Cumberland side were significantly lower. Around 50 dead and 259 wounded. Yes, that's 50. 5 -0. In the weeks following the battle, over 1,000 Highlanders were killed after being hunted down by British troops. The brutality shown after the battle earned the Duke of Cumberland the nickname The Butcher. Many Highlanders that fought on the Jacobite side or supported the Jacobite cause were made an example out of. One of the most famous examples was Simon Fraser, 11th Lord Lovett, the chief of Clan Fraser of Lovett who was convicted of treason and beheaded on Tower Hill, London, in 1747. Despite being hunted by troops and spies, Charles wandered over Scotland for five months, before escaping to France in final exile. The Battle of Culloden marked the end of any serious attempt by the Jacobites to restore the Stuart dynasty to the British throne. Within ten years of the battle, Highlanders were being recruited into the British army in large numbers to fight in Germany and North America. The Battle of Culloden remains the last pitched battle on British soil. Also in the aftermath of the battle, the British government imposed restrictive laws aimed at destroying the clan's hold over the Highlands and the Gaelic culture that underpinned it. Most famous is probably the 1747 Act of Prescription, the latest version of numerous laws previously passed to disarm the Highlands. And this time, Highland dress was banned with tartan coats banned other than for soldiers and officers and His Majesty's forces. Any Highlander wearing Highland dress was to be imprisoned, and repeat offenders were to be transported to any of His Majesty's plantations beyond the seas, there to remain for a space of seven years. The government also cleared the way for outsiders to acquire land in the Highlands and to weaken the clan system in general. The Highland clearances soon followed, the final nail in the Scottish clan system. But what is the truth about the Highland clearances and how impactful were they? To find out, please click here. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and hit the bell and tell your friends and family about this channel. If you would like to support this channel um, through Patreon and other means, um, it will all be in the description below. And thanks for all your support, um, it really does make a difference. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.